paid up. We have smaller ones. They're like business card size. You can keep them in your wallet, which is what I like to do. You can hand them out wherever you go. Then we have larger ones. If you want to hand those personally out to somebody, or we go out on Saturdays, we hand them out, we, or we put them on other people's doors. We don't knock on the doors. We just go out. We put it on their door so they have an Easter invite. We encourage you to come this Saturday. We're doing it again before Easter. So we'll be there on Saturday, 9.30, 9.45. We're just going to go around to different neighborhoods and put these on doors and get the word out. It would be great to have visitors and more people you know, come to church and join the church and, and be here for Easter Sunday. So all their information is on there. And if you can't make it on Saturday, I encourage you grab a few, give it to your neighbors, give it to your coworkers, whatever it may be, and just you know, get people invited to Easter Sunday. The only other announcement is choir practice is at 4.30. If you're interested in joining the choir, if you're in the choir, uh, choir practice at 4.30. And I think that's it. Is that, are we good? We're good. All right, Psalm 46. Psalm chapter 46. Tonight's message is entitled, Be Still. It's uh, Psalm chapter 46. Psalm chapter 46 and verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters therefore roar and be troubled, though, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved, God shall help her and that right early. The heathen raged and the kingdoms were moved, and he uttered his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth, and he breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in the thunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. And this is our text verse for tonight. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Let's pray. Dear God, I just I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. God, I pray that you just help me, God, just to be a messenger and nothing more. God, that you would just hide me and that you would show up, God, in this place. God, I pray that we would be looking for you, God, that we would be wanting you to meet with us, God. You, you know, that's my heart's desire, and I pray that that would be the desire of everybody here, God, just to hear from you. And God, I thank you for this message, and just what a blessing it's been to me and in my life. And God, I know we, we see this verse a lot, and I pray that you'd help us, God, just to get a hold of it, help me, God, to be able to, to preach the message that you've given me about this verse, God, and just the amazing just the depth of this verse. God, I pray you just help me to calm my nerves, God. And I pray that you'd help me just to uh, just not say anything that you wouldn't have me to say. And I pray the Holy Spirit would empower me tonight, God. I pray you just give me an unction to function, God. And just, just, I pray we would just all uh, meet with you tonight, myself included, God. We need you. We all need you, God. And I pray you'd help us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So one of the keys to hearing from God is to be still and to listen to the still small voice of God. You know, I thought to myself, we have the banner over there, be still and know that I am God. And I remember I, I ordered a picture off of probably Amazon and, you know, it says, be still and know that I am God. And while well, I ordered it from my office, but it ended up in my apartment, which is fine. But, it, it, you know, we all love that verse and we've heard of it and it, it's great. But I thought to myself, you know, what does it really mean? I was reading it one day. And I was actually reading it a different passage to talk about the same concept. And we're going to look at, at that today. But, you know, what does it really mean just to be still and know that I am God? Well, for one, the first verse, the first few words is God is our refuge. And I thought of that, that God is our refuge. You know, God is a place of shelter from the storm. So part of it, you know, the main topic that he introduces here is that God is our refuge. And, you know, when we have a situation, we have a storm in our life, we need to run to God and not run away from God. And I think of it, I just put my phone away before it buzzes in my pocket. So I thought of it this way, you know, if there is a storm, well, I, I'll use my other example that I was thinking of. So in dismissal, right, for school, if it's raining, 
I have to go, you know, I go out there, if not I have to, I actually enjoy it, it's kind of fun. And we go out there, I go out there with my umbrella, and I, you know, <laughs> peek into the car, you know, who are you picking up? And then I send the kid out, and then I walk the kid from the car, you know, to the parent, whatever. And, you know, we got the radio, we're right in. it's a fun time. And the one time, I just thought of this when I thought of this verse, is that, you know, the, there's always that kid, no jacket, this his book bag. Oh, I don't need the umbrella, Patrick. Thing. I'm a tough, you know, it's probably, it's usually like a tough little second or third grade boy. He's like, I don't need it. I'm, I got it. I got it. And, you know, then they get to their mom or they get to their dad. You know what? And they're like, oh, it's raining. Oh, I don't like it. I'm so cold. I'm so wet. And I thought to myself, well, if you would have just come under the umbrella or worn your jacket, you'd been all right. You know, and in the Christian life, we're over here and we're like, oh, it's raining. I have all these trials. I have all these problems. And, Complain, and then over here, God's like, "Well, if you would just get into the shelter and the refuge that I am, Amen. you wouldn't have this problem." And the reality is, is that we can't complain about the rain if we're not in the shelter. So that's all we have to do is when the refuge is over here and God's over here, and God's like, "I got you. I can protect you." I, I, you know, He has the, as Joe says, the, the hedge of protection about you. And when you're over here and you're in your problem, in your trial, it's not okay. Well, I guess I'll go over here. No, I mean, you're, I'm not going to run because I may fall, but I mean, you're running over it, you're running to God because God is your refuge. You know, whenever a trial comes or a problem comes, whatever you run to, that's your refuge. If you run to, you know, a person or a friend that you just got to talk to and get their advice, or if you run to something that just kind of takes you away from everything, whether, you know, it's a TV or, you know, you want to go relax or something, whatever it may be, that is your refuge when a trouble or a trial comes. And God needs to be that refuge, because He is. I mean, He's the shelter for us. If, you know, if it's raining, I'm not going to pull out, you know, like a, a little sweater. It's like, oh, good, now I'm protected. No, no, that would be like the world. You're trying to get away from the troubles with the, the wrong protection. No, if it's raining, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run inside. So when there's problems or troubles or trials in our life, we need to run to the refuge. And that is God. So God is our refuge. So what does that all have to do with being still? Well, when you go to the refuge... And you are still in the, you find yourself in the place of comfort, you'll find yourself in a place of closeness to God, and you'll find yourself in a place of connection to God. So those are our three points tonight, comfort, closeness, and connection. And verse 1 through 6 is a place of comfort. Letter A here, I don't have the screen, so I'll try to repeat this for those who, who take notes. So number one is a place of comfort, a place of comfort. And the letter A is a present help. Right out of verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So like I said before, it's not, you know, you're not going to be in a trial and God's going to be so far away from you that you can't get there. No, God is right there. God is a present help in trouble. You know, I remember when we were kids and I was scared. I was scared of the weirdest things, but I was always scared of dinosaurs. Obviously, they're extinct. I get that. But they were scary to me. I, 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 Jurassic Park scared me half to death. It still does. I usually don't want, I won't watch it. But I've always, I just remember that one scene, the big T-Rex head is looking in the window and just never again. I'll never watch it. And I, I remember uh, my mom used to show me these verses, you know, that God is a present help. You know, because I was a little kid, I was scared to death. And, you know, it showed me these verses that God is a present help. And it, you know, kind of helped relax my fear. The fact is that God is right there, right when we need him. I think of Peter when he was walking on the water and he fell. And immediately, God stretched out his hand. You know, when you fall or when you stumble or whatever happens in your life, you know, God is there immediately to help you. So, immediately, he's a present help. God is there whenever we need him. We need to run to shelter when life overwhelms us, you know, people will fail us. We know that. And, you know, you may call somebody, hey, or <laughs> whether you, you got a flat tire and you call somebody and they're like, oh, well, I can't help you or whatever it may be. You know, God is always there to help you. He's always available. You know, I think of, you know, they, I saw the one uh, picture or whatever, you know, God has the best connection. You know, his phone never going to die. You can always call him and you can always reach him. And God is always there for you. He's a present help. And then I think of a present help and let her be here is an immediate Strength In verse 2, uh, it says, Therefore, we will not fear. Actually, it's in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. You know, when do you, you know, get your strength back? When, you know, you're running a marathon. Well, I would never run a marathon. Let's use something. <laughs> a basketball game. I thought about this. You know, when it's a basketball team and as a coach, my philosophy for one of my teams was to run. 
Because, you know, we may have had a lot of skill, or we had, you know, some skill, but you know, a lot of them were newer players, or new to the game. I said, well, we're just going to outrun everybody. Now, they thought that was a great idea until they came to practice, but the reality is, is we were, they were tired and tired, so what did I do? I called the timeout, and they were all like, oh, okay, so now they can sit down. Why? Because rest and, you know, refuge, per se, gives you strength. And that's how it is in our Christian life is when you go through a trial or you have a difficult day or whatever it may be, go to God, go to the refuge, and you'll receive your strength back. You won't receive your strength, you know, real spiritual joy or real spiritual strength if you go to the world. You know, the Bible says, you know, in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. I mean, think about that. God never one day ran out of strength. God never one day said, uh, I'm kind of tired, I can't help you today. No, every single day that you say, man, I, I can't do it today, I need strength, God. God says, that's all right, this supply is everlasting. I think, you know, the, Jesus said to the woman, well, I'll give you water, and you'll never thirst again. God is sufficient for you. And he said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He's saying, I am enough. So if you need strength, God is an, has an everlasting supply of strength for you. You know, church and time with God ought to be a place of rejuvenation. I had to look that one up on Google on how to spell that. But of church and time with God and talking about being still. Being in a place where it's just you and God and you're there and it's quiet and it, you're still and you know that God is meeting with you. You know, that ought to be church sometimes where we can come in and say, hey, I want to meet with God today. And I, I was watching some um, revival services. They were live streaming it for us, which was great. And, and he said, you know, sometimes... We come to church and we don't get anything out of it because we didn't go expecting to get anything. And another one that he says that, and I find myself in the same situation, is that, you know, we come to church and we don't get anything out of it because we're so full of the world and we're full of junk that we're not hungry for God's word. He, he made the analogy that he went out to eat and he had this big delicious sandwich and it was so good and, you know, it was like 2, 3 o'clock and then he came home for dinner and he wasn't hungry anymore, you know, and, you know, mom was preparing him a nice meal and it's, you know, nutritious, and it'll help you, and it'll, it'll give you the energy that you need, but why? He wasn't hungry because he was so full on junk. And sometimes we come to church, and we're not hungry for God's word because the junk of the world has killed our appetite. And that's how it needs to be. We need to be in a place where it's still, and we're quiet, and we're ready, and we're willing to hear from God. The church ought to be a place where you can come and be rejuvenated, and, you know, if you're ready and have an appetite for God's word, you know... <laughs> Pastor Wilder doesn't preach anything but the Bible. So if you're listening and you're ready to hear from God's word, God will speak to you. So have an appetite. You know, God will give you strength when you are still in listening to him. I thought of in verse 3 that it dispels fear. In verse, uh, verse 2, sorry. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters therefore roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. And I thought of this, you know, that sounds like a lot of what we call in grammar hyperbole. You know, it's just, he's just giving a really extensive example to kind of cover everything. You know, and I thought of this, that, you know, no matter the situation, God doesn't want you to fear. And the Bible actually commands you to fear not, to not worry, to not fret about things. Why? Because God is in control. He says, though the earth be removed and though the, the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. So obviously we haven't lately seen any mountain now. It wouldn't surprise me in what we've been through. But we, you know, we haven't seen a mountain get thrown into the ocean. But the Bible says, even if that did happen, you don't have to fear because God is in control. You don't have to fear because if you get to a place where you're quiet and you're still with God, you'll have the peace that passes all understanding. God can conquer your fear and your anxiety. Life can be scary and uncertain. You say that They say the number one thing that causes fear in a person's life is uncertainty. When they just don't know what's going to happen or they just don't understand their situation or they're confused. and You know, that causes fear and anxiety in somebody's life. And God can conquer that. God is greater than that. And just it, getting through fear is having to trust in God's plan for your life. You know, if you trust God and you follow God and you're on that path where God has you, you shouldn't be fearing because you just know, okay, well, I'm where God wants me to be. You know, I, before I came, uh, you know, before I knew I was going to be a youth pastor, I was studying missions, and our missions major teacher at the college I went to said the safest place you can be is in the will of God. Talking about, you know, God may bring you somewhere you think is scary, or God may send you somewhere on the mission field that you think is, you know, maybe physically harmful to you. But, you know, he said the safest place you can be is where God wants you to be, because that's where God will protect you. That's where God will bless you if you're doing what God wants you to do. So it dispels fear, and then kind of going along with the same point, uh, 
1D is perfect peace. Being still, being that place of quietness with God is perfect peace. We know in verse uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it talks about, i got to go there, Philippians 4 and verse 6, talking about different things and uh, casting all your cares upon him for he careth for you. And Philippians 4 and verse 6, having perfect peace that passes all understanding. You know, we as Christians are the only one who have that. Philippians 4 and verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, when I, whenever I read that verse, and I read it often for, a, for a, when I'm preaching, because I love that verse, and you know, I've struggled with not having peace and having anxiety, and this verse is really what, I guess you could say, healed that or helped me through that, is because... We always like verse 7, and the peace of God which passes all understanding. But somebody showed me, he said, Anthony, you don't get verse 7 without verse 6. You don't have the peace of God unless you're praying about everything. It says, be careful for nothing. I was like, well, how do I do that? It says, but everything by prayer. So it's just a simple uh, thing that I memorize is worry about nothing and pray about everything. Amen. Worry about nothing, but pray about everything. If you pray about everything and everything is in God's hands, it's no longer your responsibility. God's going to take care of it because you prayed about it. That's when the worrying stops. And someone used to tell me uh, worry or anxiety is just a lack of trust in God. Because if God's got control of your life, you don't have to fear. So God being peaceful and, and still with God is will bring you perfect peace. What, where is that found? Where I mean, in this world, I mean, it's like Anthony. I'm living in it's not even 2020 anymore. It's 2021, and we're still going through some of the things that we're going through. Well, how do I find peace? Well, it's not in the rain. It's in the refuge. It, when, when you're in the refuge and you run to God and you ask God to help you and you pray about everything, when you're in this refuge that God has prepared for you, that's where you find peace. And then uh, lastly, under this uh, first point of uh, place of comfort is endurance in the trial. And Job, this is the verse I alluded to in the... In the introduction, in Job chapter 37, it's amazing how God works sometimes. And when I'm reading my Bible, God will just show me something. I, I was going to read Psalm 37 in one of my devotions in the morning. because You know, I know I like that Psalm. I've read it before. I said, you know, let me read Psalm 37. And I accidentally read Job 37. I don't know how I did it, but I did. And I read this verse, and God actually gave me the message through this verse that I read here. In verse 37 and verse 14. It says, hearken unto this, O Job. Now this is Elihu's discourse, and he's talking to Job, but he's got a message from God. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. He said, stand still. And I you know, it's talked about endurance through a trial. No one in this room, I believe, I guess I could say this, has gone through something worse than Job. I mean, Job in one day lost literally everything he possessed. He lost his children. I mean, we, we know the story. And he went through a terrible, terrible trial. And, and the, God's advice from Elihu to him was to stand still. You know, ju just just stand still. Just be in a quiet place where you're at peace with God. And God showed me that message. You know, Anthony, you know, the reason or the, the way you endure a trial, you know, in 2 Timothy, I believe it is, and when I wrote it down, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, it talks about endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, if the Christian life was just easy, if it was just a free ride to heaven, you just do whatever you want, we wouldn't have been called to be soldiers. You know, God calls us to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. I mean, we're going to go through hardship. We have an enemy who's going to try to stop you from doing anything godly that God wants you to do. We talked about a little bit of that in the discussion panel. That, you know, we have an enemy that, you know, I want to do, I want to go to church more. I want to, you know, be more faithful. Or I want to invite my friends to church. Well, the, the enemy's going to try to stop that. But that should never stop you from doing what God wants you to do. We talked about it before. I mean, if somebody makes a good play in a basketball game, I'm not just going to quit the game and you know walk out as a coach. No, you're going to keep fighting and keep doing what you're supposed to do. So if the enemy tries to stop you from doing what you know you're supposed to do, don't ever let that stop you. Just keep doing what you're supposed to do. Endure trials. It may be a hard day. It may be a long day. You, you may have not gotten sleep last night and you say, you know what, I need to go to church today. The reality is, is that there are just going to be hard days as a Christian, that's why the Bible says endure trials uh, and endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I know I just, the, my, the trial that my family went through, and some days I would just have to endure. 
You know, I remember someone used to tell us, not every day is going to be a good day. And that's the reality. Some days you're going to have a bad day, but that doesn't mean God is not your refuge. It doesn't mean the Bible has changed. It doesn't mean that God can't help you. You just need to get out of the rain and run to the refuge. So be still and know that I am God. Some days you'll just need to endure. So it's a place of comfort. Be still knowing that he's God is a place of comfort. And then secondly, it's a place of closeness. God will be close to you in the refuge when you are still. In verse 10, uh, i got to go back to Psalm 46. In Psalm 46, in verse 10, it is a place of closeness with God. In verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. I love how he says, I will be. It wasn't like, oh, well, maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll be exalted over everybody. No, we know that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's a promise of the scripture. It was in the Old Testament and it's in the New Testament that Jesus is Lord and he is going to be exalted among the heathen. That's not in the notes, but I love that part. God will be close to you in the refuge if you are so. So be still and know that I am God. You, uh, place of closeness. Letter A here is an advanced knowledge. So we have a place of comfort, a place of closeness. And letter A is advanced knowledge. How well do you know God? I mean, it's a very simple question, but it's a very convicting question. You know, how well do you know God? Do you know God better than you did last year? You know, we had a lot of, well, some of us had a lot of extra time on our hands this year. Did you get to know God better? You know, the Bible says, uh, Paul says in Philippians 3.10, 3.10, that I may know him. You know, Paul had this utter desire just to get to know God in the, the rest of the verses, the power of his resurrection. You know, how bad do you want to know God? Because I, you know, I, I say it every time I preach, I feel like, you know, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. If you get close to God, God will get close to you. How bad do you want to know God? Because God knows everything about you. So the closer and the more you want to know about God, the closer he'll get to you. You will know God better when you are still. And this is what I kind of want to get to breaking down this verse. Be still and know that I am God. I remember in Bible college, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's down there. You will know God better when you are still. We lose focus on the craziness. Uh, we lose focus when we focus on the craziness of life, and then we lose sight of God. When everything is quiet, you hear better. You say, oh, that's simple. So if we all, if I just stop talking, see now we hear the fan, we hear the air conditioning, right? We hear the whatever it may be. We hear little things that we didn't hear before. Well, if you quiet down and you're a part of the day and you just don't focus on everything, you take it, you take every distraction out and say, Anthony, that's not possible. I promise you it is. It may take a little bit longer as it does with me. I'm very easily distracted. I mean, I could be in a room with nothing. I'd be like, I mean, I would just get distracted. It's true. But you have to put all distractions away and just, just everything quiet and, and you'll pick up new things. I mean, if you read, if you pray to God... And see again. I'll, I'll just go for it. If you pray and you talk to God, and there has to be a time when it's just silent. And I never knew that. I never thought about that until I went to Bible college. And one guy taught it, and he said, "Just pray, 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 and then just stop. Just stop talking and start listening." Because you're not God. Now God's not going to speak to you in an audible voice, but God will speak to you in your heart. God will show you different things. You, I remember. I think it was George Whitfield said that he would meditate in silent prayer for hours each morning. Silent prayer, meaning he's not saying anything, he's just silent and in, he's still with God. So it's an advanced knowledge of God. But it's not just for an advanced Christian. Being still and knowing God and getting closer to God is for everybody. So it's an advanced knowledge, and then letter B is an everlasting omnipresence. Letter B is an everlasting omnipresence. In verse 11 it says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. It goes right along with the with the present help. Is that you know God is always with us. Jesus says, that, you know, behold, I or I will go with thee. And he says that all power. He's talking about in the Great Commission. He says that he's going to go with them everywhere that they go, and 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 the Holy Spirit is we know is with us everywhere that we go. Is that God's omnipresent means that He's everywhere at all times. You're never going to run away from God. And you're never going to get to a trial that's so difficult or you're never going to get so far away from God that God won't take you back. God is right there waiting for you. He's always with us. Jesus said, I am with you always. You know, you are never alone. Literally, there is never a time in your life when you have no one. You will always have God. And he's the best friend that you could ever have. There may be times in your Christian life that you feel 
lonely. But I want to tell you today that you can always talk to God. And that's not just saying, oh, okay, now you won't feel lonely. No, the reality is, is God is literally there with you. I mean, it's omnipresent. He's always there for you. And he'll, he'll, he'll talk to you, and you can talk to him, and he, he'll be the best friend that you'll ever have. He'll never wrong you. He'll never talk bad about you. and He'll never do anything that disappoints you. God is the greatest friend you'll ever have. And whenever you get lonely or feel down, God is your refuge. Nothing else in this world is your refuge, but God is your refuge. So when you're in the rain, run to the refuge and be still and know that he is God. So he's, he's always there. He's omnipresent. And then a place of closeness, we have advanced knowledge. Everlasting omnipresence, and then lastly is an enhanced focus. And I thought when everything is still and quiet, you can focus better. Well, I mean, why do I tell the students to be quiet when they take a test so they can focus better? Well, when you do your Bible time, when you're still and you're talking to God, make sure that you are enhanced in your focus. And I think of, you know, Pastor Nuwana's message today goes right along with that. that you know, we've kind of gotten out of focus as Christians, and we need to be more focused on God. And you are more focused on God when you are still. We need to be more focused on God and less focused on the world. Whatever you are more focused on right now instead of God is an idol in your life. God needs to be your top priority. Now whatever it is that you're thinking about that may not be God or throughout the day where he says, well I was going to read my Bible but I got this going on or I was going to go to church but I've got something else planned that day. Whatever your focus is that isn't God is an idol in your life. And we need to be still, know that he is God, and realize that he needs to be our top priority. And then our last point here, we have a place of comfort, a place of closeness, and then lastly, a place of connection. When is the last time you connected with God? Now I'm a preacher, so I kept him alliterated, but just talking about what is the last time you heard from God? I mean, think about that. When is the last time you knew, without a doubt, God just spoke to me? Was it this week in your devotions? Was it last month in your devotions? Was it last year? When's the last time you say, man, God spoke to me? I mean, it's an amazing thing when God can speak to you and God opens up and he shows you something from, something from the Bible that you've never seen before. When's the last time it happened to you? And I, 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 not to condemn you, but it's not God's fault if God hasn't spoken to you. It's not God's fault if he hasn't spoken to me. It's my fault. It's, it's your fault because God is there. God's never left. God's never moved. God's not on vacation. God is ready and willing to meet with you if you meet with him. Be still and know that he is God. It's a place of connection. There has to be praying. It was, when was the, the last time that you met with God? And I, I would dare to say it was the last time that you were still. It was the last time that you, you took time aside and you just gave God your undivided attention. And obviously, and I'm a teacher, and sometimes I, I know I don't have the student's attention, so I'll do a few different things. I'll either just you know yell at him from across the room, hey, focus up, or I'll just walk up to him, and I'll just keep teaching. And he's just like, I was like, yeah, your book's not even open, or whatever it may be. You know, you know, I, as a teacher, want his undivided attention. Well, God wants your undivided attention when you do your devotions. You know, God wants your... Undivided attention when you pray to him. Yeah. And I know that's difficult. I'll pray and I'll talk to God and, and, and oh, my phone will buzz. Oh, or something will happen. And the best prayer times of my entire life, I can tell you, is when I went outside, I left my phone inside, I told, you know, you know, hey, hey, I'm going to pray, or whoever it may be, don't bother me. And that was the best times of my life when I just knew I had no distractions. I knew that I had nothing to, you know, take me away from that. And obviously, it's... It, when I'm in my house or whatever it might be, I, I've given the story before that, you know, the best time or the best place for me to pray is here in the morning. Because I don't know why, it's just a personal thing. If I, if I pray at my house, I just, I just get distracted. I don't know why. But it's just how it is. You know, you have to find a quiet place that you can pray. It may be in your house. It may be outside on your porch when it starts getting nice out. It may be in the woods somewhere. It may be in your car in a parking lot somewhere. I used to do that all throughout college. I'd take my car and I'd park in a Walmart and I'd park all the way in the back, and I'd just read my Bible, and I'd pray. One, because I had a lot of roommates, and I need to get away from them. But it's a good, quiet place. I mean, you could park anywhere. and just You have a quiet place right there with you and God. So you have to find a quiet place with God. Go to a quiet place and sit there and think about God. I mean, this is talking about, realistically, what it means and what it looks like to be still and know that He is God. One, we need to think about God. I mean, it's... It, I mean, it's not weird, but this, when's the last time you thought about God? Just thought about it. Charles Spurgeon said, I cannot go 10 minutes without thinking about God. You know, I've gone hours without thinking about God. 
And Charles Spurgeon is, you know, we don't worship man, but we know he's a great man of God and a great preacher. And you know why? Because he says it right there. God was always on his mind. What is always on your mind? Uh, you need, maybe your mind is just cluttered with so many things. Maybe rightfully so. Maybe you've got a lot of different things going on right now. I know this time of the school year, I'm sure Pastor Warren could attest, is when it starts getting real busy and you're trying to crunch everything in and just get these kids to, to pass and you get off to summer break and you have a lot of activities. We've got, you know, after school activities going on. It's just a lot going on. But there has to be a time where you can set those aside and just be still and pray with God. Prayer is the most important aspect, aspect, aspect of our Christian lives. Do you pray? I mean, think about that. Do you pray? I'm not talking about, you know, Lord, thank you for this food. Bless to our bodies. Amen. And you can always see it. You always know how good the food is by how quick the prayer is. It's just a side note. But, you know, that's not the only time we should pray. Before you go to bed, okay, Lord, thanks for today. and Help me to sleep and good night. No, but, I mean, do we really, really pray? You know, we know we should. I mean, if I, if I were to say, raise your hand if you should pray today, everybody's hand would obviously go up. But if I said, raise your hand if you actually prayed, well, we'd have to put some hands down. You know, the sad thing is, is that, you know, a Muslim will pray three times a day, but it, the statistics show that a Christian prays five minutes a week. And we have the real God. I mean, it's the God of heaven that we get to talk to, and they're talking to nobody, and they have more commitment. And we need to get, you know, excited and, and real with the fact that prayer is the most important thing we can do as Christians. I mean, whether it's Wednesday night and we stay and we pray and we talk to God, or whether it's in the morning when God wants you to get up and pray for yourself, for your family, for others, and there's so much we can pray about. Say, Anthony, I just can't pray for a long time. Come talk to me. I've got plenty of things that you can pray about. Why don't we pray? Well, for one, we, we don't realize how important prayer is but also we need to pray with all of your heart god is not interested in half-hearted prayers i'll say that again god is not interested in half-hearted prayers you know prayer is communication if Haley said anthony i just you know let's talk after dinner we had a great meal and just talk about our day and if i was just like yep yeah. mm -hmm. and i just gave her half-hearted uh apathetic lethargic kind of conversation she wouldn't be interested in that and the problem is with my prayer life sometimes that I'll just give, you know, I'll just talk to God. All right, God, you know, this family member, heal this person, and okay, I'm done. God is not interested if you're not interested. God doesn't want you to just check off the list. Okay, I'm done praying for today. God, I met with you for today. No, God is just so amazing and so real. And when you get to know that, your prayer life changes. And when your prayer life changes, your life changes. And that's the biggest thing that a Christian can do. I've heard it's the most spiritual thing that a Christian can do is pray. But the sad truth is it's the least thing that we do. I know in my own life, it's the thing I struggle with the most is prayer. And, and it's just so, prayer is rewarding. Prayer is the one thing in the world that can change your life and change others' lives. You know, I tell, them all the time, I tell the teens all the time, I can't change your heart. Only God can do that. And that's why, you know, I pray for each and every one of them. But Because I can't make them do anything. Only God can help them and instruct them and, and put it on their heart to do different things because prayer changes things. Pray for people. Pray for yourself. And then I've already hinted about this a little bit, but listening. So this point is a place of connection. There's praying and then listening. Don't just pray. Listen. When you're, at the, when you're in the refuge, you're, you run away from all your, your problems for saying, you just get with God, you get alone with God, pray and pour out your heart to God, but then just stop and listen. It may just be quiet, and it may just be peaceful, and it's the most peaceful state in all of the world is when you get alone with God and you pray and you know you met with God and you can just sit there in silence and peace. You say, Anthony, you don't know my house. There's no silence. Well, like I said, drive in a car somewhere and get quiet because I'm telling you, it's just... Not that it's some weird mystical thing, but peace and quiet and a, a quiet, still place is where God will meet with you. We talked about it, getting the distractions out. And then lastly, this is the last one we'll go through, is 1 Kings chapter 19. Many of you know this story. It's talking about Elijah. Many, uh, sorry, 1 Kings chapter 19. Listen for the still, small voice of God. Listen for the still, small voice of God. And this is where we'll close for tonight. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 8. It said, And he rose and he did eat and drink and went to, in the strength of that meat, 40 days and 40 nights unto her of the mount of God. And he came thither unto a, a cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of God 
uh, the, sorry, the word of the Lord came to him and he said, what doest thou here, Elijah? So he's pretty much saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am only am left, and they seek my life to take me. So number one, just the closing thoughts here, number one, Elijah had a rightful but misguided anger. He thought he was the only one. He's like, man, I am the only one living for God. And sometimes you're at your job site or with your, maybe your whole family's unsaved. You feel like, I'm just the only one living for God. Well, obviously, look around you. you know, there are other churches in this world. There are other Christians in this world that are living for God. But you know, we can't get discouraged in the fact that you know, maybe we feel like there's less people living for God than there used to be. The, you know, the reality is, is that God will always have people. God will always build his church. It's a promise. I will build my church. And we need to trust God for, for that. We're not alone. And we talked about that earlier. In verse 11, keep reading. It said, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. But after the Lord, but, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after that, after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out. And he stood in an entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice on him. And I think it's interesting. Note this. It's the same question he asked before. What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been here. I'm very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. And because the children of God have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So we see here, God asked the same question, and Elijah gave the same response. He said, oh, I, I told you I'm here. I'm just, I'm in my own little pity party. I'm the only one left. No one else follows you. Everybody's throwing all this stuff away. The only thing different about this time was the Lord's response. And he said, and the Lord said unto him, Go, return unto the way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou camest thou, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And skip to verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and in every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he's pretty much saying, Elijah, you're not alone. And it's, uh, point two here, uh, Elijah had a rightful but misguided anger. And then two, God is not for the show. Meaning the fire, the earthquake, the whirlwind, all of that. You know, God wasn't in that. But what was God in? He, he was in the still small voice. So there's a lot of things nowadays that it may look like God is in it, but he's not. You can't just say, you know, this is godly, and it may not look godly, it doesn't line up the scripture, but, you know, someone, so-and-so over here said it was godly, so I'm just going to go along with it. There are things that look like God is in it, but he is not. God is in the still, small voice. And then we see here that God is not for the show. And then number three, God is looking for someone who will listen to the still, small voice. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will answer you. So when we talk about the still, you know, being in a still... To be still and know that I am God. Listening to the still small voice of God. God is not hiding. You know, God is it's not a game of hide and seek, and God's not the undefeated champion of hide and seek, and just nobody can find him. No, the, the sad thing is that we've just gotten lazy in our searching. We, we, we've just been so okay with God not speaking to us. You know, it's just how it is. I'm just rolling through life, and God doesn't speak to me like he used to, but, you know, I, I, I hear from God every once in a while, and that's all right. No, we have to be. We can't be satisfied with where we're at in our Christianity. We have to be seeking and searching after God and listening for that still, small voice. I believe that it's still and it's small because the reality is we have to be in a still place and in a quiet place to hear it. And God wants you to intentionally go after him. God wants you to intentionally make time for him. You know, like you talk about with me and my wife, I have to intentionally make time for my wife and, you know, go on dates and talk and, and whatever it may be. God wants the same relationship. God wants you to be so intentionally in love with him that you say, you know, God, this hour in the morning is for you. This 30 minutes that I have on my break time is for you. You know, when I get home, God, I, before I eat dinner, I'm going to pray. Or, you know, after I eat dinner, and instead of watching, a, you know, this show, I, I'm just going to take that time for you, God. You know, we can make time for God if we want to. But we have to diligently seek after God. The Bible talks about that. It, you know, God rewards them that diligently seek Him. You say, well, I haven't felt very rewarded of God lately. Well, maybe the diligence isn't there. Maybe it's just half-hearted prayers or half-hearted servants or half-hearted fellowship. And the reality is, is that God is not looking for that. God wants somebody who's wholeheartedly 
following after him. And that's where God meets with you. God, that's where God shows up and God will speak to you. And that's why I see here in the story of Elijah. That Elijah went into the cave 40 days and 40 nights without the food, fasting and praying and talking to God. And then God showed up and he relieved his burden. So in conclusion, God is our refuge. God wants us to know him better. We need to be still and know that he is God. God wants us, in our three points, to have comfort. God wants us to be close to him. And God wants us to be more connected with him. Take time to be still. This week, tonight, and in the invitation, take time to just be still and know that he is God. Run to the refuge when you are in a storm. Listen to the still, small voice of God. So I don't know what you're going through tonight. I don't know what burdens you have. And I don't know what struggle you may have. You may just say, Anthony, I just need to meet with God. Or I just need this burden lifted. I just been, I've been so worried about this thing. And it, I'm just going to put it in God's hand tonight. Don't be that kid who's in the rain complaining about the rain when I have an umbrella. Okay, don't, don't be the Christian who's complaining about trials when there's a God who's a refuge and he just wants you to run to him. So maybe you need to run to God tonight and give him the trial and the struggle that you're going through. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for loving us. And God, I thank you for this message and just the help it's been to me. And God, I pray that it just touched somebody's heart here tonight. God, I pray that we wouldn't just hear it and we wouldn't just accept it, God, but that we would respond to it. God, I pray that if somebody is here that needs to talk to you, God, if somebody is here that needs to be still, and I'd say that's probably all of us, God, and take time to pray and talk to you, God. And maybe it's tonight, God, and just want to take extra time and pray to you, or, or tomorrow morning, God, they're going to make sure without a doubt that they intentionally meet with you, God, and that they're still, God, they're not distracted, and they're not thinking about all the things that they have to deal with, God, but they just take time and be still and meet with you. And God, I pray for myself specifically, God, that I would... Listen, God, intentionally for that still, small voice, God, that I wouldn't be satisfied with just reading or just praying, God, but that I would desire above anything to hear from you, God. I, I so desperately just want to hear your voice, and I just want to know that you're speaking to me specifically, God. And God, I pray all of us would have the same burden. God, I love you. I thank you for loving me. I pray you bless this invitation tonight, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Let's stand and sing that invitation song. I have decided to follow Jesus, and may that be the prayer of our hearts this evening. tonight, Lord, if we draw nigh to you, draw nigh to us. 
And Lord, that would be our prayer this evening, Lord, that you would, Lord, just strengthen us, Lord. Lord, we desire to have a closer relationship with you, but Lord, we know that sometimes we just need to put out those distractions and just make a committed effort, Lord, to meet with you. And so, Lord, help us that our relationship would be strengthened, Lord, that we would know you each and every day in a more personal way. And Lord, as we grow and as we would come to know you each and every day, Lord, that our faith, our, our, our walk with you would just grow stronger. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done this, this day here. And Lord, we just pray that as we leave here, Lord, that those things would just be a part of our lives. Lord, that we would leave here changed. Thank you, Lord. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Take us home safely this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.